Um, yeah, so I mean, Amandeep introduced me very nicely. I just wanted to give, I just kind of want to dial it back a little bit to kind of my origin story, how many people, um, you know, my origin story is not unlike uh, the story of many other uh, Punjabis in the diaspora. Um, you know, my parents had an arranged marriage. Uh, when my, you know, grandparents went to go see uh, my father for the first time, uh, my nana, nani, my maternal grandfather and maternal grandmother, um, you know, they, they're checking him out. They come back home to tell my mom about him. Uh, they walk through the door and my mom approaches my grandfather, you know, asking a question about, you know, how is, how is he, what does he look like and all that. Uh, my grandfather kind of makes a kind of a joking kind of jab to my mother saying that, uh, you know, you would like him because he also wears ripped jeans, kind of like you wear, you know, kind of taking a jab at my mom for not wearing nice clothes as well as my dad. And my nani grandfather sounded saying that, you know, de mu tote, uh, tote like the uh, face of a tiger is never washed, uh, to say that, uh, you know, don't judge him just based on his appearance. He has many other qualities. He's accomplished. He's educated. He's in Sikhi. Um, and that one proverb, you, you know, utilized in that way, kind of won my grandfather over and went, won my mom over. Um, and, uh, and then later that week, they got married. So um, just to show you how proverbs have been used in the past, kind of a story that we've been told growing up uh, about how my parents met and all that. Um, we heard these proverbs growing up, you know, grandparents use them, parents use them. Um, proverbs are utilized by, I've heard them by teachers and, and various arts like music, you know, people use them, martial arts, people use them. They're entrenched in Punjabi culture, you hear them in different songs, you hear them in movies. If you are listening to um, like scriptural discourse, Katha, you'll hear them there by Katha Vajraks. Um, so they show up everywhere, right? And these proverbs, uh, wherever they go, they carry along with them, you know, parcels of Punjabi wisdom. Um, and this book is an exploration into that. So I just want to try out and see how the audio is. That's been much better than before, but there were still points where it broke up. So, I mean, it's, it's one of those kind of impossibilities, really, to, to try to resolve. Um, it's probably internet rather than than having a microphone around you. I see. Um, I can uh, switch computers um, as well if you give me like five minutes. Do you think that is? Do you think that has a? You found it with that computer. Was that the same computer you used for the talk a few weeks ago? Yes, um, it was. But uh, yeah, it is a tablet, so maybe that's why. But um, yeah, we can swap it if you want to just talk about. Uh, uh, Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay. You're, sound, you're sounding good now. Okay. Good. Um, so like I mentioned, um, you know, the book is a compilation of these uh, 54 proverbs. Um, this is kind of the layout of the book. People have asked me, oops, people have asked me why uh, I picked 54. And I'm going to just kind of uh, answer that question right at the start. Um, there's really no good answer besides the fact that, you know, in the Eastern traditions, people think about 108, the number 108, as being really auspicious, you know, a spiritual, religious, kind of a, a heavy number, almost serious. Um, and we wanted to kind of make this book really light and fun, uh, easy to toss around and all that. So we thought, you know, we're just going to cut it in half. Uh, and that's how we ended up at 54. So um, to those who haven't seen the book, this is kind of the layout of the book. Each page has one proverb on it. Uh, it's written in Gunbuki, it's written, uh, it's transliterated into English, translated on the left side, um, and then a little bit of context is written on uh, beneath that as well. So it's a tiered approach that's gonna um, be useful to you know, a couple of different generations. The older generations who know Punjabi, uh, they'll be able to, you know, just look at the Gurmukhi and be able to read it and automatically, you know, the meaning, the stories, you know, the sayings that they've heard around this, that'll come to them. Uh, to the generation maybe that was born in the West, but, you know, speak Punjabi at home, but don't know how to read Gurmukhi, 
they can get, um, you know, they'll get from reading the transliteration. And who those who are just born in the West don't really have a grasp of Punjabi um, can just read the left hand side and, and that'll be useful to them as well. So um, this is how uh, the book is laid out. There's a question here about illustrations in the book. Uh, this version doesn't have illustrations, but that may be a possibility for the future. So one of the reasons that I kind of went down this path in, in terms of Proverbs is that I found uh, Proverbs really interesting because uh, it demonstrates a very important point that we often overlook uh, when we think about language. Um, you know, language is a vehicle through which thought is articulated. So uh, language develops in a certain context. Uh, it doesn't develop out of nowhere. Uh, it doesn't develop in a vacuum. It develops as the culture is developing. So language reflects the culture around it. So the type of language you use, um, even largely governs how you think about certain things. So um, people say to think in a language is to feel and to see the world in a particular way. And to change uh, somebody's language is essentially how to change how they think. So in looking at this problem, for example, um, you know, if you say something like uh, spaghetti vargi siddhi, you know, you know, all that loses the spaghettiness out of it. You know, this proverb here um, holds that typical uh, Punjabi type of sarcastic humor to it as well, right? That you can see. Um, and kind of reading these, it like brings you into that uh, mentality as well. You know, it's using, you know, an age old treat that's been enjoyed for centuries. Actually, uh, not long you mentioned the Sudish podcast. Um, in one of the stories about the Sudish podcast, so this is a text written 200 years ago. It's talking about one of the Guru's weddings, Guru Tegh Bahadur's weddings, and it mentions you know, how they were giving out jalebis, you know, to the you know to the people that had come to the wedding. So, um, if you're engrossed in you know the Western world and habits and and the culture and the language. You know, reading some of these proverbs and using them, it automatically brings you back uh, to the Punjabi culture and Punjabi uh, thinking and humor, uh, which I which I enjoy. And it can be very lighthearted, uh, like this one here, or they can kind of change, um, and they can go the opposite side as well. So I'm just going to skip this one here, and you know, the proverbs can be really um, you know lighthearted and fun, but they can also be um, you know, uh, philosophically heavy and, uh, you know, can be quite somber as well. So this one here, I've illustrated this with, uh, you know, a painting of Guru Gobind Singh, uh, because sources from the 18th century and the 19th century both talk about, um, both tell a story about how Guru Gobind Singh mentioned this proverb, this proverb being, uh, um, but first, you know, how I translated this, I translated this as the response to a stone thrown at you is a brick. You know, the principle behind this proverb is one of, you know, escalation of force. You know, and I say this, uh, the difficult proverb, because literally, it to javab, the response of an it, uh, it in Punjabi meaning a brick, and patr meaning a rock. So it's actually quite reversed, but I switched it around in the translation to ensure that the principle the meaning behind the proverb is conveyed properly because contextually, for those who don't know, in the past in Punjab, an it, a brick, uh, there was, you know, not what an English speaker who grows up in the West would think of a brick. You know, bricks were made from material which was rather soft, they're very small, um, and a patara would be the opposite. A stone would be, you know, quite large, very big, hard, heavy. Um, so to convey the meaning of the proverb properly, I switched this around uh, for the modern audience who's going to be engaging with this book. Um, and this does show how a literal translation of the proverb, you know, may not convey the right meaning or convey, in fact, the opposite meaning. You know, if I had said, uh, you know, to the response to a brick is a stone, it might suggest, you know, a de-escalation, of course. But, you know, that would be totally inconsistent in the way that we see this proverb being used over time. So again, I, I mentioned this illustration 
uh, of a portrayal of Good Wilbur saying on the right-hand side here and how this proverb is used in both 18th and 19th century texts, uh, historical records talking about uh, Guru Gobind Singh's life. And this um, is a story uh, where Guru Gobind Singh is leaving Anandpur after 1704, he's on the move. Uh, they meet with another community leader head, the head, a head of a, a Dadu Panthi community. Uh, his name is Jatram who had heard about the martyrdom of the sons of Guru Gobind Singh and they suggest yeah, that, uh, you know, yes, you know, an atrocity has happened, but at this point, it's probably best to practice uh, forgiveness, you know, essentially forgive and forget. Um, and basically in this battle, like this poetry battle between Guru Gobind Singh and, and Jafaram, it includes this line about it da jawab patthar, in the context that yes, you know, forgiveness is the path uh, for those adopting a saintly mentality, but for those who are fighting against oppression, in that context, the Irtadajavapathar mentality, um, you know, the response to a stone is a brick, uh, is the supreme mentality that, uh, no, we'll face them head on and we will escalate against them to stop this atrocity. And it's mentioned here that, you know, in that story, everybody laughs and realizes the different context and, and their principles in each. And what I love about this is that it just doesn't get used in Sikh literature, um, but uh, in Punjabi songs as well. In fact, I'll play a little audio clip here uh, shortly. Uh, the lyrics to this song were written during the Brit British Raj in India. And this is towards the end of the British Raj. Um, the songs of rebellion that arose during that time, uh, which I'll play for you here. One of them includes this proverb. Um, so I'll just, I'll just play that here for you guys. So I, I hope that uh, clear is that loud and clear for everybody. I'm gonna be. I came across really well. Thank you. Oh, okay, perfect. So um, these lyrics were written, you know, in the early 1900s. Uh, recently, so this is a, a, a song called Farangi Ralke by a specialist in True School. You know, um, it's interesting that th these lyrics were written in the early 1900s, but they have taken it. And I think this song was produced uh, in the early 2000s, maybe 2010. Um, but, you know, you can see now that, okay, it's used in the 1800s, it's used in the 1700s. Now it's used in the early 1900s. Now it's used in the early 2000s. You know, this proverb is, is carrying itself through. For those who didn't get the lyrics there, it's just, it's basically saying that um, uh, the line is, you know, So we're going to use, we're going to respond to the British basically by, um, you know, escalating force against them using that uh, proverb there. So, you know, this is what I really love about uh, the Proverbs is that they kind of carry through time and they take their, um, you know, their uh, principle with them where they go. And just regarding kind of the, um, the purpose as well behind uh, the book here um, before we kind of jump into more playful aspects of the Proverbs. Just changing slides here. Oops. So when people think about uh, Punjabi heritage, you know, uh, preservation, you know, obviously we have Akfa here doing a great job. Um, people, it, it manifests in many different ways. So, um, you know, people think about Punjabi competitions. This is if you ask people about, you know, how is Punjabi culture being preserved? You know, uh, people think about, you know, dance competitions, Punjabi competition, uh, Pangra competitions, you hear about Punjabi music now mixing with Western music, you know, crossovers to the mainstream. Um, you have this new surge of uh, diaspora community who are engaging with instruments, you know, from back home, like the tol, the sarangi, tumbi, 
you know, there's a new appeal uh, amongst people in the West uh, to play some of these instruments. Um, you have festivals like the Drabar Music Festival, you know, gathering in Indian classical musicians from all around the world to perform in England. Um, you have uh, in the cuisine scene, you have many, uh, you know, tons of Indian restaurants, you know, Punjabi food is basically mainstream essentially nowadays. Um, this is a photo of Punjab uh, in central London. Um, like I mentioned, we have um, institutions like Akfa, you know, organizing these talks, you know, book clubs, another way we can explore uh, the literary wealth that we have in the community. And I think diving into these proverbs though as well, you know, the proverbs, the idiom, Punjabi poetry of the past, is one way uh, to keep many of the core principles of the culture uh, moving forward in the diaspora as well. But specifically in terms of language uh, preservation, in Punjab, uh, within the past century, uh, we've had movements like the Punjab, uh, Punjabi Suba movement in the 60s, late 50s, it started. Um, where there's a book, big push to preserve and to make sure the Punjabi language is utilized. Um, basically, this resulted in an increase in literature production in Punjabi. A lot of books started coming out during this time, uh, collecting Punjabi proverbs, publishing them. So there are books in Punjabi. Uh, when I get back on the video after this, I'll show you this, you know, this one by Professor uh, Bikram Singh Kumman. Um, there are books that have come out during that time, during the 60s and 70s, that have um, searched out and gathered these Punjabi proverbs, translated them in Punjabi, um, so they aren't lost in Punjab. And even today, I know that uh, in the schools, in like primary schools in Punjab, they do teach these proverbs to people, to the students there, to ensure that, um, you know, the new generation growing up, if they've not been hearing them at home, they will be explained to them. They will be taught in, in the schools in Punjab. Um, but for those, you know, that's all fine and well for those people who can read Punjabi or who have access to Punjabi education system out there. But for the diaspora community, um, even if you can read Punjabi, so that's the thing, there may be books in Punjabi about uh, Punjabi proverbs, but um, to those uh, you know, people in the West who are reading it, they may not understand the books and you know even if you can read Punjabi you know some of the meaning of the context is quite different from the literal translation of the lines so um, the project was largely to increase um, you know this it was an attempt to kind of preserve some of the the proverbs that we have and display them to the west here and the result of that kind of the feedback that we've got from that has been uh, incredible so far it's been about a year uh, since uh, this book uh, has come out, and um, I did want to share with you some feedback that we've got about it. Uh, so the biggest and most meaningful feedback that I got about the book was that when people took the book home, it was it became this kind of intergenerational bridge. It it uh, it bridged the gap between the generations. You know, allowed for three to four generations to come together, share memories share stories, you know, talk about the culture and have some laughs. Uh, for us in the, you know, diaspora, there are significant generational gaps, obviously, uh, education wise, often there's a big disparity between kids born here and, and their grandparents. Linguistically, a lot of the kids um, don't know Punjabi, um, can't have a good dialogue, even if they do know a little bit of Punjabi, they can't have real meaningful conversations. Uh, with their grandparents and socially obviously there's a gap there um, because of the change uh, in modernity you have you know different expectations of how kids should behave and you know all the small and, and big things that call it cause tension between generations yet amongst all of that you know when people came home and, and they brought these proverbs just showed it uh, to their parents or their grandparents they they told me it's created you know great times of sharing and bonding uh, grandparents telling stories about when somebody used, you know, a specific proverb in a certain way. Um, you know, parents also saying this, you know, they've heard so-and-so say this, in, in, you know, when they were young. Um, but, you know, these proverbs really don't get utilized that much, you know, as the culture uh, is kind of 
fading away. So for me, that was the biggest uh, feedback that I, I really didn't expect that level of engagement. Um, I thought uh, might be used by some people in my generation as a way to kind of have a laugh with their grandparents, maybe use it as a quick joke or a quick quote. Uh, but I didn't realize kind of the stories, uh, the moments, the memories, uh, all associated with uh, the different proverbs and the lines used. So um, that was one that was one really big, uh, meaningful you know feedback that I received from people who have uh, who have got the book. So. Um, in addition to that, there's also um, seeing this book kind of travel in circles outside of the Punjabi community. So um, I had the fortunate ability to send it to Erica Badu, who, who really enjoyed the, uh, the book. Erica Badu is a very famous artist. Uh, she shared it amongst her followers, millions of followers on Instagram. Um, you know, had the ability to share it with Jimmy Singh, uh, federal leader here of the NDP in Canada. And um, if you actually go on my Instagram, you can see uh, a video of Jagmeet kind of reading and explaining some of these proverbs as well. Uh, he really enjoyed it. Um, when I was in England, uh, Sonny and Shay from the BBC were uh, very kind uh, to bring me on to their show to talk about it. Um, and in addition to that, we've got orders from all around the world, you know, Paris, Australia, New Zealand, um, all across Europe. Um, you know, I'm in Mexico, so it's in places where I never thought they would be an interest. Um, it was just one of those unexpected uh, positives that came out of the book. But um, to those who maybe know the culture, know the lay of the land in terms of the, the religious, cultural, social scene, a lot of the proverbs that are in the book, they may not seem uh, so foreign because a lot of the the sentiment behind the proverbs, you know, the meaning, the values behind some of the proverbs that I said, they take form in uh, in real life. Um, so, for example, um, in the book, there's a proverb that says "Vandakai, Kandakai, Ardakai, Hardakai," meaning sharing your food is like eating sugar. Eating alone is like eating bones. And this is, you know, basically akin to the Western sharing is caring, uh, you know, the, speaks about the benefit of sharing your food and, you know, how it's, you know, basically it's important to share your food. And that's what's most enjoyable when you share your food with somebody else. And obviously, for those who know, you know, the concept of longer in the Sikh tradition, um, especially nowadays, given, you know, the, the pandemic, people are still going out there and distributing longer. Um, you know, it's a core value that we have in, um, in the community and, and you can see it, you know, actively take form today. Um, well, like, can, you, other... can you say that one again, it's a bit, bit slower in Punjabi because <laughs> as you said it then translated it and I want to go back. It's a very, this is a tongue twister, which also makes, you know, the <laughs> proverbs are, are, are fun to say like that. So, Vandakai, Khandakai, Ardakai, Hardakai. So Vandakai to share your food. Right. Khandakai is like eating sugar. Yeah. Ardakai to eat it separately, to not share your food. Hardakai is like eating bones, basically. Brilliant. Thank you. So, um, yeah, if you say it really quickly, it's a bit of that, uh, it's a bit of a tongue twister. So, um, like I was saying, these proverbs, you know, they manifest uh, in different ways. You know, there was... Um, in culturally, we can think about how pluralistic uh, the community is. Uh, there's a proverb here, uh, So the five fingers of the hand are never all the same. So, you know, this speaks to the, you know, the kind of principle that, you know, not everybody's the same. Everybody has their own purpose. Everybody has their own use. Everybody has their own value. Um, which is very um, something we always need to remind ourselves, uh, especially given the current today, what's happening. Um, and then socially, you can think about um, just you know pedagogy, how how people are taught, just uh, kind of principles that people uh, hold dear. Uh, there's a proverb here in the book: "Sehej pake so mita hoy." Slow growth ripens sweetest. So this is akin to you know, the Western slow and steady wins the race. Um, 
obviously, you know, the, the idea that, you know, not to rush into anything, to let things mature slowly, gradually, uh, to take your time. And, um, and yeah, so there's quite a, quite a variety of proverbs in, in the book, you know, like I mentioned, there's, you know, sarcastic ones, like the Jalebi, what you said, the, you know, straight as the Jalebi, there's uh, serious ones that I mentioned, like, you know, the response to uh, uh, stone is a brick. Uh, there's even, you know, strategic ones, you know, there's one, Siddhi Ungli Nal Kyo Nahin Nikalda. So you can't get butter out of a bottle with a straight finger. So this is kind of like uh, akin to the Western, you know, the wind does not break the tree that bends, you know. So sometimes you have to kind of bend the rules a little bit uh, to, um, to get your way in a sense. So I mean, we can kind of make this a little bit more interactive at this point to have other people jump in. Um, but I did want to pose a question to the people as well who are listening here. Um, because, you know, when we think about Punjabi Proverbs today, um, one of the main feedbacks that I got as well is that, you know, people said, oh, I never heard of these. You know, I never knew that there was such a vast amount of these. You know, and I've only put 54 in here um the books that i've sourced these proverbs from and use their translations they are uh they have many you know there's many different books you know there's quite a lot um and you know the new generation had no idea about this and i wanted to pose a question that you know is this a problem of you know uh, the newer generation not knowing the language you know is there a language barrier here or uh, is it a problem of you know these proverbs are irrelevant in the sense that you know the values um the sentiments behind the proverbs they're slowly uh disappearing they're kind of fading away um so yeah this is a it would be an interesting discussion to have with everybody um and then amadeep i can send it back to you and then um we can just discuss some more proverbs yeah let's do that so thanks for that Joanna. so we're going to do a bit of a so why don't you put your hands up if you want to if you want to share a proverb with us put your hand up and um, uh, I'll open the line and you can share them. And we're going to do something else with it, aren't we, Javala? We're going to, we're going to do a bit of a book giveaway. Javala, yes. you can be the judge. Um, the top few, I don't know how many, let's see how, let's see how many good ones we get. Um, then I'll, I'll, I'll grab your details afterwards and we'll, we'll do a signed book giveaway. Radio. Um, oh gosh, look, lots of people. Lot, oh my goodness, lots and lots of people. Um, Javala, do you want to have a shot at just opening your camera? Because the sound has been really good over the last okay, perfect. The last period. So if it goes bad, I'll ask you just to switch it off. I'm going to keep my, yep. mine off. All right. Um, I'm going to... Well, let's start with J Jassa then. Jassa, why don't you kick off? You're right at the top of my list. Jassa, unmute yourself. Accidental click. All right, no worries. Um, Sat. Oh, Satminder Semi. My. Why don't you go next, Sammy, Over to you. I'm mute. Okay. <laughs> it's not so much about a proverb. Nice to see you, Emily. Anyway, and it's a question about why Punjabi is the only language that's got the same word said twice but with a different inclination, like chachu pilo, roti choti khalo, son sulo. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And why is it just only happening in Punjabi and no other language? Uh, I mean, it's a good question, but um, I wonder if, if that's not in the English language. I'm I'm not aware uh, I, of other languages that that do it or don't do it. But I would imagine that would be a normal occurrence, to be honest. Um, I don't see that as. Um, Especially unique, I think. Uh, it doesn't think happen in English. It doesn't happen in French. It doesn't happen in any la other Latin language. It doesn't even happen in South in South Asian languages. Hmm. It's a it's what a, it's a good question. Yes, yeah, uh, anyone can propose a <laughs> propose a book on that. Yeah. There is this funny <laughs> thing in Punjab that you see a lot is that this real love yeah. of little rhyming couplets as well. You see it a lot in political yeah. posters. 
um, uh, little advertising slogan, much more so than you see uh, in the West. It just seems to be, it does seem to be. job is so common. You know, wherever you look at it, it just keeps coming up. It's interesting. Maybe there are um, listeners on the uh, on the call here who can think of other examples. I can't think of any examples at the moment. That would be interesting, you know, exploration into that. Um, there are uh, people who are looking uh, deeper linguistically into Punjabi specifically. Um, you know, that there's a lot of good research on that. Like I mentioned, since the 60s, Punjabi Suba movement. Uh, there's been an increased uh, examination in Punjabi specifically, but one thing we do have to realize is most most Punjabi speakers are actually uh, on the Pakistan side of Punjab, um, which is also very interesting to think about how um, you know that divide had really separated us and really um, kind of limited us in our in our ability to examine it as well because we've we've isolated a huge um, portion of our community. I see a comment here saying that in English rhyming Cockney, Cockney slang. Yeah, but Cockney slang is very different because Cockney rhyming slang is putting a, a, a quote for another word like apples and pears is stairs. So they'll just say apples and pears rather than stairs. But with Punjabi, it's a proper word that's been repeated, but with a different inclination onto it. Kalkulo. Right. You know? Let, let's move on to some, let's move on to yeah. Sammy, something thank you very much. Sensible. Something thank sensible you. next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm speak to you soon. Call me, yeah? I will. I will. Cheers. Uh, everyone give Sammy a follow on Twitch as well. If you want to see one of the finest penmen uh, in the world, he's an extraordinary uh, calligrapher. Satwinder Sam, at Satwinder. Semi. Right, let's move on. Uh, Pam Kula, over to you. Hi, everybody. Hi, Pam. Um, I just put my hand up because I wanted to share a quote. Go for it. Yeah, this was one. It's funny that my parents were just here. My dad's 80, and so he obviously grew up in Punjab and came here in the 1960s. So he knows lots of um, quotes. So he gave me this one because I was saying, oh, do you know, can you remember any? Um, so it's lag gay naro tut gay changi jedi be kadrandi yari. Have you heard that one before? I have not. No. Okay. Do you want to explain that one for us? Um, so it's basically, um, I guess, if you're in a relationship with somebody and they're disrespecting you, so it's better not to be in that relationship at all. So mm. that's why it says lag gay naro tut tut. So it's like being mm. in a, you know, probably more like a romantic relationship, I think, with somebody who's not appreciating you. Interesting. Yeah, definitely going back to the social, how to interact with people uh, type of mentality. That's great. Thanks yeah. for sharing that. That's okay. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Okay, uh, I've got a couple of these. I, I grew up with these, so um, I'm happy to share them. Uh, one is Ulta Chor Kotamal Kodnati. So, uh, Jwala, I don't know if you've heard that. And the second one is Kade Gade Nubi Bab Bana Lai Da. Break them down for us, Indy. You can't just leave us hanging. Yeah, can you? Okay. So, the first one is Ulta Chor Kotamal Kodnati. Ulta Chor. Chor is a, uh, a thief who's been caught by the policeman. Oh, Kotwal no dant da Kotwal haga the the caretaker of the say the cell, the police cell. So the thief is behind bars, but he's scolding the policeman. Or the thief is behind, the thief is scolding the policeman, saying. So that's where the praise comes up when someone is being cheeky. So the chor is the chor, but he's scolding the policeman. So that's where it comes. Ulta chor Kotwal ko dante. And you'll get many situations like that where you got a cheeky guy who's in the fault, getting yeah. defensive and aggressive. Interesting. So that's a awesome. that's a famous one that you know I grew up with in my childhood. And the second so you one, heard that from your from your parents or your grandparents? I, I grew up in Kenya and we spoke Punjabi and everyone, all the Sikhs in Kenya speak Punjabi. They don't really speak English to each other, mm. which is slightly different to British Sikhs. And I live in London now, so um, 
Yeah. But I grew up, you know, with very, because the, the community in Kenya went there a hundred years ago and they're frozen. They still hmm. believe in the hundred year old Punjabi proverbs. Awesome. And, um, and the second one? And the second was, uh, the second one was, which means if you want to get something done, sometimes you even have to make your, a donkey your father. <laughs> Interesting. If you want to get something done, I, hmm. you know, swallow humble pie, make a donkey of your dad if you want something done. So that's, these are kind of, you know, stuff we grew up with. We have many, but I can, uh, I want to read your book first in case I'm repeating them. Well, you might no, be free one in there. Yeah. All these three, the three that I've mentioned here, I'm not, are not in the book. So there's a, there's a wealth of these that people know, right? Um, and yeah, we can, uh, I'm going to definitely get some more people on and we'll hear some more. Great. Thank you. Let's Thanks go. for sharing those. Thank you, Indy. Uh, next one, Jaspreet Gaur. Hello. Hi, Jaspreet. Hi, sorry. I didn't know if you guys would be able to hear me. Um, I don't know very many. I would really love to win this book though. Um, so, um, Mary Billy Menumiao is like a favorite that I know me and my sisters love to just joke about and say all the time, which is basically just about like, you know, your cat talking back to you. Um, and usually it's just something that we imagine our moms have probably said to us quite a bit. Right. No, that's wicked. Yeah, I've seen that been used absolutely uh, in films, more recent films and like even on Instagram, I think there's like an Instagram page with that, with that uh, name on it, I think. But yeah, that's an awesome one. The joke ones are, yeah, you can kind of see the Punjabi humor come through them, right? So, which is awesome. They must be, Javala, they must be crude ones as well that you couldn't put in your book. I'm not asking you to... I mean... <laughs> well, you might. We're all grown ups here. Ones that I had to exclude from the book included ones like, um, because the dictionaries that I was looking at, like the Akan Kosh, the Pro proverb dictionaries, um, they did include all of, like whatever ones people were saying, and they did include ones about women and caste uh, and, you know, and drugs, alcohol and stuff. So obviously those type of ones I didn't include, um, you know, because we wanted to make this, you know, for everybody, for kids who can kind of enjoy this as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't go down that way. All right, I was trying to goad you in uh, telling us some, right? <laughs> uh, Pritpal Pullar. Uh, there you go, sorry, unmute yourself, that was my fault. Unmute yourself, please. Hi, I'm Andy. Hi, Joala. Um, I'm not sure if it's the sort of thing you're after, but my mum struggled to remember any from her childhood. Uh, but the one she came up with was Maja Mine Botakote uh, Fedda Fede, which means um, mum's not been born yet, but the sun's already walking on the roof of a building. Um, and it refers to a fire because when you light a fire, the smoke is already up in the air before the fire lights. Right. Interesting. And Where did you hear that one? You said your mom was talking? My mom, yeah. She rem that's the only one she could remember from her childhood. Do you remember what context that she heard that? Was somebody using that? So it's just something she remembers hearing when she oh, was younger. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Very cool. Yeah, the context is the important one, isn't it? Like, how do you translate the, each of these what I'm hearing? I want to know yeah. like, how do you use them in a modern, not a modern context, but yeah, what's it trying to say? Because we're so used to English ones, aren't we? It may well, was... it may well be to do with, um, sometimes it can be hard to light a fire, but yeah, you'll create lots of smoke. So it could be uh, something that's come out of that sort of frustration of it, perhaps. Hmm. It's interesting. One thing that I, one feedback that I did get is that when people took the book home, they did say things like, you know, my parents had heard this proverb used in a different context. Um, so there are like multiple meanings, which is quite normal amongst, uh, you know, proverbs and like idioms as well. Right. Um, a lot of them have multiple meanings that you can kind of that people use in different contexts, different circumstances, different situations as well. So, um, Hearing the situation and the context behind the proverb, bring it to light as well. 
uh, which is really sure. good if people could share that as well. But thanks for sharing that one. It's very interesting. Yeah, and I think that's on the chat window. I don't know if you've seen it. You probably haven't. But Pam just said, I think it means running before you can walk, right? So the, the mm. child's not just walking, but like run up the stairs and there's a little on the roof of the building. Um, I think that makes makes sense. Right. Uh, let me pick a few more names. Um, Aisha Hassan. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Um, it was really a question because, um, well, for, first of all, um, my parents are from Pakistan. So um, we're Muslim, we're not Sikh, but they are Punjabi. And uh, it's interesting because I grew up listening to them speak with each other. And that's how I learned my Punjabi. Um, and it was a question actually for uh, Javala. Um, a few years ago, I mentioned the proverb, you've probably heard the proverb in English, which is red sky in the morning, shepherd's warning, red sky at night, shepherd's delight. And I happened to say it in front of my mum, and she right away came up with a Punjabi version of it. And I was stunned because it was word for word, almost the same thing. And I just wanted to ask if you, if you know that at all in the Punjabi? No, not at all. I'm not even quite sure what that means. Maybe you could explain that in English as well for us. Um, oh, it's just, it's a reference. Shepherd's pie. Right, yeah, it is a British one. Uh, it's a reference to, you know, if you ever ski, see a red sky uh, in the morning, it just means that um, it's going to rain later. Um, uh, and actually, if you see the red sky at night, then, then it's not going to rain the next day. It's a predictor of... Of, of the weather, which obviously we're very obsessed with here in England. Um, but apparently there's a, a, a very similar Punjabi one, which has the same meaning, mm. but you might, you might know it. No, yeah, so you got me on that one. Um, but do you, you can share it with us as well if you, if you know it or if you No, I'll have, to ask, okay. I'll have to ask my mom. <laughs> no worries. Very interesting though. It's a very, it shows kind of, it seems very like British, right? Um, that that proverb but yeah they are very cross-cultural as well like a lot of these have very similar like english equivalents there's one in here um uh share ne sada masi khana like a, a tiger is always going to eat meat um which i've seen in this book and there's a line in guru granth sahib guru arjan says it sing ruche sad pojan mas like a tiger is always going to eat meat or is always satisfied by meat um and then it's very similar to like the Western, you know, a, a tiger never changes its stripes type of thing. So um, a lot of them are very cross-cultural. And you can see like, you know, Guru Arjun is writing that in the late 1500s, early 1600s. And, and it's very similar to an English one. So there's not always of the case of that. Um, people think perhaps that because of Western influence, some of these ideas came from England, from the West into Punjab. And people just made their own Punjabi versions of them. But that's not always the case as well. I mean, there, it, it's always a back and forth. Um, Absolutely. Many, and and yeah. I think, um, you know, we say, you know, in England, we're obsessed with the weather. But of course, in the Punjab, they're big, it's a big agricultural community. So for them, the weather is really important. So for Absolutely. them to be able to predict it as well. Absolutely. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah, wicked. Thanks for sharing. Thank you, Aisha. Appreciate that. Um, there's a question. There was a question on the Q&A, actually. Was it, did you... Did you look and see if there was anything different happening across the east and west of Punjab, or was this, or was this kind of universal across that that whole area? That is a very good question. I did not. Um, you know, this is a, a you know introductory exploration into these, um, but I did see when I did do research, um, I did see that people in Punjab have been distinguishing people. There, there were books that. Um, you know, there was a book, and this is maybe something I can send out as a link um, when, you know, the following day. But there was a book that was talking about Western Punjabi proverbs um, uh, specifically. So, um, you know, with that type of dialect and, uh, you know, uh, the dialects, there's so many different dialects in Punjab. And Punjab, as we know, has sh shrunk quite a, quite a bit, right, since, you know, partition and then you have uh, you know, the Jabisuba movement, you know, the borders shrank again. Uh, so um, what we could think of 
what Punjabi is has changed slightly over time as well. So there are dialects that people would say, modern day Punjabis would say, oh, that doesn't even sound like Punjabi, but mm -hmm. it's like the Western uh, dialect of Punjab. So um, yeah, that's something that needs to be explored for sure in, in English writing. But I know that there's Punjabi books that have ex explored that, but I didn't make any distinguish, uh, distinguish distinctions between them when I was writing this book. Okay, let's, um, oh my goodness, we've got 39 questions and I've been editing them and 25 hands up. So let's, let me just try a few more hands and then we might, um, I'll give you a few questions. I'll curate a couple of questions. Uh, Naresh Sharma, why don't you go next? Hi there, how are you doing? Right. That's um, a great talk, thanks very much. And um, I work at SOAS, University of London, where I teach Punjabi. And I think um, your awesome. book would go down great in my language classes. I just want to say oh. that I've really enjoyed this talk so far. Um, and I wanted to share a little sort of saying that my nani used to say to my, about my nana. And um, the context is that, um, and they're actually, they were from West Punjab. So the, the context is that my nana, I mean, an adorable, loving man, he, he, he had a reputation of being very strict though and everyone in the family was um, was a bit scared of him. He used to love cooking and um, had a reputation for doing like a, you know, a really mean barbecue and delicious biryanis and kebabs and stuff. And when, you know, us grandkids, we used to dread sitting next to him at the dinner table because he would just keep on putting more food on our plates. And if we didn't eat much, he'd, he'd give us a really hard stare. But, you know, it was all well-intentioned and you know came from a really loving place and we have um fond memories of him obviously but my nanny she used to say of him Kwanda har, kasanya har. so um i don't know if you've you've heard something like that before no please go ahead please explain it so Kwanda har. so he feeds you as if you're a son-in-law um and you know the the sort of the background is, you know, you really look after your son-in-law. So he used to like, you know, feed us. But he'd look at us like a butcher, you know, so like a butcher is ready to, you know, slaughter its prey. It's got a really, you know, he's got a really kind of like a mean look about him. Now, I, I don't know if that has any other meaning, um, this particular saying, but um, yeah, it's just something that she used to say about him and, and it kind of like really fit fitted for us because he used to feed us really well but then he would have this really sort of like strict gaze if we didn't eat all the food and yeah so that's, uh, that's yeah, just something I wanted to share that's amazing that actually really that actually reminds me of a line um, again Guru Arjun is using this type of proverb it's a this is a line from uh, Gurajan's uh, Gurbani there, but um, very much the same thing that, you know, on the exterior, well, you know, this proverb is speaking, your one is speaking about, you know, how generous he is, but, you know, um, from the exterior, he can look quite, you know, intimidating, mean, uh, aggressive. Um, in the same way, Gurajan, when he was saying that, it was like, you know, I may look aggressive and I may appear like, uh, like I might scare you, but really, you know, I'm your, I'm your servant type of thing. So, it's very interesting that kind of uh, dichotomy there, but um, you know, you see that type of element in the Punjabi proverbs, like that that idea that you know you always uh, you're always generous with your food, regardless of you know whether you're looking at somebody like a kasai, like you said. That's a that's an amazing proverb. I love that one. Thanks. Thanks yeah. yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Naresh. Um, let's go to Navjit. Navjit Sultar. Who we know. No. Hi, hi Javala, it's her noor, it's not Navi. Oh. Sorry to disappoint you. Um, I have a question in the QA and um, I'm just gonna read it out because I realize it's a bit lengthy, so you can ignore it um, once I've read it to you. So there's an assumption that um, Punjabi proverbs are very patriarchal. So most of the proverbs about men, they generally portray them in a face-saving manner whereas proverbs about women, with the exception of mothers and daughters, are about how cunning they can be. 
Um, and there's an abundance of mother-in-law and daughter-in-law proverbs that have found their way into Punjabi folk songs. Those proverbs are essentially folk wisdom. So I'm just going to give you a few examples before I ask the question. So mother proverbs, Mava um, Tandiya Chawa, which is famous um, in Kudit Manak song, which means mothers are like cool shade. And Interesting. Ma Razi Ta Rab Razi, um, self-explanatory, but essentially, if you keep your mom happy, then it's akin to, you know, remembering God or keeping God happy. And then, Hello, can you just get like a teeny bit closer to your microphone? Because you're just cutting in and out a little bit. Is this better? Well, we'll have to have a shot at it. Go for it. Okay. Um, and then mother-in-law proverbs. That's the theme. <laughs> um, that's a famous one. And with sons, they're often presented as precious gifts. So, putra jehimeve rab har iknu deve. Sons are like sweet fruits that should be given to everyone, right? So, did you come across any of these gender constructions when you were researching Proverbs for your book? Um, it's interesting that you mentioned some of these, because now that you mentioned them, I, I recognize uh, that I've read some of these in older sources as well. So, you mentioned that, you know, Mama, Tandia, Shama, that's in Kuldeep Manik's song. Mm. There's a story in the Suresh Prakash, you know, 1840 text, when Guru Teg Bahadur, I believe, uh, I, I want to make sure I'm getting this right, when he goes to uh, Amritsar and then he's denied entry there, uh, it was the women of Amritsar who actually come to his, uh, uh, you know, help and they help him out and they treat him very well. Um, and he says that proverb to them to say that, you know, um, you know, praising them, saying that, you know, you're so helpful and, and uh, you provide shade and you provide, you know, comfort. Um, so, I've, so, you know, that text is 200 years old and you can find that one in there. So, um, and some of these other ones, like I did mention in some of them, I, you know, in the Proverbs, there's a book, actually, there's another question here about, you know, what resources did I use? Now that I'm on the camera, I can kind of show you. Uh, this is a book, Punjabi uh, Mahavra at the Akhan Kosh. Mahavra means idiom and Akhan is a Punjabi, you know, specific word for proverb, although Mahavara is used um, sometimes loosely to mean proverb as well. But um, so in them, they do talk about these proverbs related to women. Um, some of them, you know, I can't remember off the top of my head, were not that um, generous uh, to women uh, or daughter-in-laws. So, you know, obviously I just, I didn't include those. But, um, you know, like in the questions underneath your question, people uh, have commented saying, you know, there are people doing research on this in the academic field. Um, I didn't, um, obviously there are gender constructions when researching Proverbs. Yeah, I did come across them. Um, and, uh, but I didn't include the ones that I feel I thought would be kind of negative towards women. Um, but yeah, these are great. The ones that you did share. Ma'arazi uh, ta'arabrazi. There's a one similar. I mean, it takes the, the, the the mother part out of it, Jisuki, Jahansuki, you know, if you, if you're happy, the whole world is happy type of thing. But, um, but these are brilliant. And uh, I wish I had talked to you before, but uh, I included these, these are, these are great. Um, but yeah, did you have, I mean, well, ones I have, you wanted to I had share? a few more, if it's okay. Yeah, Mind me share. So this is about the, so when I said that mothers and daughters, the only exception where they, they're not perceived as, as cunning, and they're praised. So, Chiriya da Chamba, so, you know, it's uh, the bird's nest. That's how daughters are described. And I was actually listening to a lecture, so, you know, kind of like work related type of thing. Um, yeah, there's a really fascinating talk on Punjabi proverbs. Hello? Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, I think that, in, that was an interference. Um, there's another one, Sadi Chiriya Vang Udari, which is a famous. Uh, it, it's in a famous song by uh, Narendra Biba um, and another proverb Mape loka de paga nu jamte, basically saying that when a mother or father raise a daughter they're essentially raising someone else's destiny because the daughter is, is temporary in her parents home right, right? so there's a there's a lot of these quite um, uh, emotional about about the daughter these particular proverbs I, I thought would be good to share with you guys no, that's awesome. Yeah, it definitely shows, um, you know, a different side as well. Like I said, like, you know, the Proverbs carry with them sentiments and values and ideas and stuff. And certainly, 
you know, um, there is that the praise of women as well that come through when you're sharing these proverbs as well. So it's not just, you know, it's not one sided in the sense that um, the culture is um, specifically or only, um, you know, has negative things to say. There's obviously, like you said, very positive uh, proverbs there as well. So, um, no, thanks for sharing that. That's awesome. All right, let's keep moving forward. I don't know, thank you very much for that. You would be up for a free book, other than I'm pretty confident you've got a copy. Um, all right, let's move on to a few more. Good Nam Singh, why don't you go next? But now, if you take yourself off mute. Yeah, thanks very much, Yuval. That's some really interesting stuff there. We actually did a program on the Carl Channel a couple of years ago around Akan, and we got massive response. So clearly, this is a kind of topic that um, people love to talk about because it kind of brings brings up their childhood memories. And I can uh, remember quite a few, and and they're really about body parts and about the body. So there's some kind of misogyny and maybe even racial connotations in the world. My mum always used to say to me, Kale Mualia, Nile Peravalia. So I never quite knew what that meant, but it kind of had its effect anyway because it was obviously a good telling off. But other ones into the body, again, there's one that's a Dini Niki or Nitiki. But then there's a kind of riposte to that, which my wife often uses, which is Jinna Lama or Nenakama. Translate them both, uh, good Nam, please. I think they're pretty self-explanatory, but I only can speak Punjabi. Jinni uh, the smaller you are, the kind of sharper you are. But then you know that's often a re uh, reply to that as well. The tall, because it's somebody who's tall that will maybe you know kind of make fun of somebody who's small. But then they'll come back and say, but Jinna Lama, how you know the, the more tall you are, the, the more stupid you are, and come or kind of useless. So I think there's a kind of really interesting power play, uh, the way oh, which you know. Yeah. Could, could disarm people maybe using these things and you know it's almost as if this you is utilizing the power of language in order to challenge authority as well yeah absolutely no that's that's a very important point that you raise is that um there's a lot of back and forth so just because we see one to say you know to present one perspective it doesn't mean that's the only perspective that's the only proverb out there you know there's there's this back and forth right like proverbs are naturally witty like they're they're naturally meant for discourse to be thrown back and forth um to be used in a convincing way because you know one small phrase it it brings along so much more meaning with it right so that all you need to do is throw, throw that phrase out like i said at the start of the at the talk with that story, my nanny, uh, my maternal grandmother was able to convince people just with that one phrase, which with that one line, even though, um, you know, she wasn't that, uh, as was the time, like she wasn't uh, educated, she was illiterate, but she was still, you know, very sharp, very wise, uh, you know, using kind of the knowledge, uh, the wisdom of the past in a way that uh, was convincing. And absolutely, you're right that it's a, it's a power play. And like, you know, um, you see, um, you know, there was, there was proverbs in there that, um, that get used in historical texts as well that talk about, you know, the sacrifices that six made and, and, uh, you know, like, uh, we are like grass, like the more they cut us down, the, the more we grow. Um, you know, there's, there's stuff like that. There's all, like, there's rebellious ones and there's a lot of back and forth. It's meant for that. It's meant for that play. Um, so absolutely, you're right. And thanks for showing both sides. Come, come back in. I think, yeah. I mean, Baba Fridji, much of his slokes are really in, in proverb form and very cutting, very short and cutting. But there's one more that I've kind of come across, which is a very short one. It's probably the, the one that even Westerners know is this is a de Fate. Does it mean literally, you know, rip up the floorboards? Because I would have thought in the kind of olden times there were no floorboards there anyway. So what, what does it actually mean? Chakka de Fate. What does it actually mean? I think it's like a. See, that's the difference between a Mohavara and a proverb, right? A Mohavara and a, a Karn. So a Mohavara, a, pro, a Mohavara would be an idiom. So an idiom would be like, if you were to say, um, oh, it went over my head. You know, this is also why the proverbs are very important uh, to translate and to give the context, is that even if you, lo even if you know the language, um, and you see this with, you know, if you're trying to teach somebody English, and you say something like that, they'll understand over, they'll understand going over, and they'll understand head but they don't understand what that phrase means, right? You have to know the context of that phrase, meaning, oh, that went over my head. I didn't understand that. Or 
um, like uh, somebody mentioned, you know, quite a, like a British one uh, earlier, if I were to say, you know, we're going to touch base, touch base is, I've heard people in England not understand what that means because it's an American uh, idiom, you know, in reference to baseball. Um, so the context uh, matters a lot. What you're speaking about, I think, uh, you know, it was used in wood mills. Somebody can correct me properly uh, about this if they know the real meaning to that. Um, but it was just kind of an idiom to say, all right, let's go here. Let's, uh, let's get working. Or basically, uh, it's kind of like a, it's an idiom used to pump each other up, basically. But the distinction between an idiom, a mahavara, and a khan, a proverb, is that a proverb is going to also not be taken literally in terms of the words used in it. Um, but a proverb is going to encompass a element of, you know, value. It's going to have a philosophical component to it. It's going to have, you know, some type of um, other elements like that. You know, it's, it's more of a teaching element. You know, it's going to teach you about values. It's going to be philosophical and that type of thing. So uh, there's a distinction between idioms and proverbs in that sense. But um, for those who, who know better about that, Chakrabarti, please, um, please comment on that when we when we invite more people in. But yeah, thanks for sharing that. Thank you, Gurnam. Appreciate appreciate that. Let's keep moving on. Well, let's take a couple more, Joel, and then um, the biggest asked question is, how do you get access to your book? So that's going to be the one I'm going to finish up on. But let's ask a couple more people to speak. How about uh, Raji Gaur? Unmute yourself. Hi. Hi, Raji. Hello. Jawala, first of all, your name is so lovely. Um, I really oh, enjoy nice. saying it, Jawala. Um, I, I did have a question in the chat. I'll just read it out to you. Thank you for bringing these proverbs to us. I find my generation aren't 100% confident speaking Punjabi, unfortunately, much less stating proverbs. So this book is exceptional to help with that. Will you be on a pursuit to unearth lost proverbs? Have you ever worked with any artist to highlight a particular proverb you find essential, i.e. through music? Like, there's an artist called Raginder, I don't know if you know, and I think it would be really beautiful if you kind of collaborated. <laughs> In my mind, I sort of see you, I don't know, doing something like that. Is that possible? Oh, collaboration, absolutely. I mean, um, since the book, um, there's been a lot of thought as to kind of how to improve it for another rendition of it. Uh, and illustrations is, is exactly uh, the next move to that, um, as well as, you know, including Shamuki script in there as well. Mm, yeah. um, but uh, also thank you for that kind word at the start. But um, yeah, definitely I'm looking for collaborations for people to work with. Uh, musically, like uh, Hernur mentioned, there's a lot of these proverbs in Punjabi music already. Um, but yeah, to bring it to life even more, definitely, I think uh, it would be awesome to, to throw in music, art, uh, other literature, because, you know, the proverbs uh, can be funny as well, but in a lot of ways, they encompass a lot of our culture as well, right? So they show kind of the values, uh, what we drive is important, social etiquette and all that. Um, so well, I think that's why it would be valuable, I think, for our generation, for them to connect with that, because I do think there's, there's, we've lost so much of our language through immigration, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for the, the no, book, because you. it brings, it unearths all of that. Um, if I could just share one that I've, I've found, yeah. which I think resonates with females in my generation. Um, it's very simple. I don't even know if it's a proverb, it's more of just a saying. Sono sabbi guru apni. So particularly I say with females because, you know, we are coming into this new generation where we are finding our own romances, finding our own careers, you know, whatever, we kind of take the lead now. Um, and I think it's still really good to listen to others, but do what you feel is right. Yeah, can you repeat that, sorry, for us? Sono sabdi karo apni. Oh, right, yeah, wicked. Yeah, absolutely. Take the advice of everybody, but, you know, ultimately, you're going to be responsible for your own actions. So, you know, yeah, make that judgment yourself. Awesome. Thank you so much for speaking oh, thanks with for me. Sharing. No, thanks for tuning in and sharing those. Sorry, I keep muting myself. Thank you, Raji. Let's go to Avi Abninda Rao. Abninda, unmute yourself. 
Hi, Jawala. Can you hear me? Yep. First of all, fantastic talk. And uh, thanks, Ramandi, for organizing this. Um, I've got two, which are probably the complete opposites on the spectrum. One is a very, um, uh, very serious one, but actually makes us all understand the mother's role in uh, everyone's life. Gunge diya ramja, gunge di ma samje. Basically, in very simple language, from what I understand, it means only a mother can understand her children, how they feel, even if they are dumb and cannot speak. I mean, that's you know about a mother, doesn't I it? just heard from like upstairs, my mom just dying laughing at that, so. All I right. That's <laughs> so it resonates with everybody, right? Um, but, you know, the, like you said, um, these proverbs and uh, do um, send out a very powerful message in everyone's lives. The second one, which we've used as children and heard it often, and I haven't seen it in your book, so I'm glad I can bring it up, is Noso Chua Kake Bili Hajinu Chandi. I've heard that one. Uh, oh, we've used yeah. it ourselves so many times. It's like, you know, when- Have you break it, have you break it, break it down, break down the-, the oh, Basically, literally, it means uh, first, uh, a, a cat eats 900 meese and then goes off on a pilgrimage. And for me, that, comes down to the fact that there are people I've met in my life who've done all the wrong things and suddenly they become so religious and they become so um, strong about uh, everybody else and uh, have this um, very narrow view of everybody else because they're not religious in the same way. And often we turn around and say, he's one of those not so to Hakage Billy Hadrich elite person. <laughs> and uh, Joala, have you heard that one before? I've heard that one used. Uh, I've heard that one used in my family as well. So it's. Uh, I think that's a common one, but a very apt, very a funny one as well. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Uh, can I just add one more to this? Uh, again, yeah. it's a very simple one. La diti lohi taaki karega koi. Simply, if a person loses his modesty, then no one can restore his dignity. Mm. Very powerful, but very simple. Yeah. Applied and you see the life. spectrum, right? You can see, you know, the first one very caring and, and very loving for mom. And then the second one also um, kind of uh, poking at hypocrisy. And then the third one, you know, very somber and kind of philosophical as well. So, yeah, they're, they're so, uh, there's so much uh, range in these, right, that you can explore um, that everybody would have fun with them. But, yeah, thanks for sharing those. those are uh, really thank you for listening. All right, Abby, thank, thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Anjwalia. If you unmute yourself, Anj. Oh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Um, one of my parents used to say to to us all the time, "Nakto lakhe, nakto lakhe rakti." So whenever she used to ask me to like take a plate into the kitchen or something, and I used to I didn't want to, I used to leave it somewhere and not in the sink or something. So that's the line she really used with us. Tran translate that, Ange. So basically, nakto lake bulte rakti. So you get something that your mum might have said, can you put this in the sink? But you don't put it in the sink. You just kind of like shuffle it along a little bit. Mm. Because literally, what do the words, what do the words literally mean? Literally, they mean you've got it from your nose yeah. and you put it on your lip. Yeah. So what's the point of that? Awesome. <laughs> I'm going to use that with my kids, I think. Yeah. Lovely. Because if you've no, heard that right. one before. Yeah. No, I've not heard that one, but um, that's an amazing one. Definitely to be used in the household, I think. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. That's okay. Thank you. And let's see who else. Let's take one more. I've got the video all of it. <laughs> And then we'll. Um, yeah, heard that one. Then you can talk about how, uh, where, where you can get the book from. So let's go to one more. Uh, Baram Singh. Hi, can you, okay. Can you hear me? Uh, we can. Okay, I have two of them. My, my uh, eighty-year-old father is here as well. The one I like is Vadasir uh, Vadisir Dardiyam which uh, translate as the bigger the head, the bigger the headache. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my dad That's has wicked. one. Which one? I like that one. Goldsmith. 
So sunyardiya ek lohardi, meaning a um, hundred hits by a goldsmith versus one hit by a what would you call it? a blacksmith? Blacksmith, yeah. So that's it. Do you know in what context he would use that? You can ask him if, like, how he would use that one. You want to come here? What context would you use that in that? Thing nearly patha da jawab idnal. Okay. The koi banda jada na ho so vai to under war kada tu jikko vai war karke the saara barabar karun dia. Yeah, so he's saying that if someone is like maybe poking at you a uh, hundred times, then a blacksmith can uh, respond to that with one hit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. Very, very cool. That, um, yeah, like you said, it's very similar to the Irtadaj Wapatan one. So, um, yeah, interesting. The fact that, you know, a blacksmith is going to hit very hard, whereas like a goldsmith is going to just, you know, just hit very little, right? It's kind of like a poke. Um, mm -hmm. Very interesting. That's awesome. I love those ones comparing two different things. It's like there's one in my book, uh, So Chacha Ik Pio, So Daru Ik Kyo. So, like, a hundred chachas, a hundred uncles are equal to one father, and a hundred uh, bottles of uh, uh, alcohol are equal to one bottle of uh, uh, butter, basically. So, um, very interesting. Like you mentioned, you know, some of these are very. Um, they're using also stereotypes of different castes as well. Like when you're talking about how a sunyata would kind of hit very lightly, but a lohad would just hit very, very strong. Um, those kind of ones are, are very interesting uh, to engage with, but uh, those type of ones I didn't put in the book, but uh, it's wicked that you shared that. That's awesome because it's very similar to the other one as well. Now, thanks for sharing those. Those were awesome. Yeah, thanks for writing the book. I'll definitely uh, pick it up. Very grateful. Thanks. Thank you, Baron. Great, great, great way to end that. A great example of this kind of intergenerational conversation and dialogue yeah. that you talked about earlier on. Now, look, the big question um, that's come through from 200 and plus people that have been online is how do you get access to your to your book? So why don't you talk about it in the ter in the different territories as well? Because it's very difficult here in the UK. To get right. It. Well, basically anywhere. So if you're in Canada, you can order off Amazon uh, Canada. If you're not on, uh, if you're not in Canada, if you're in the UK, anywhere else in the world, um, just send me a message either on my Twitter or on my Instagram um, or uh, on my email. There's a Patreon link there as well. You can send messages to um, just send me a message about, uh, you know, you're interested in the book and, you know, I will ship one out to you while we are uh, currently getting um, our stock up on the Amazon uh, UK, Europe, and America sites. So quite simple, just message me if you're outside of Canada and I will sort it out. You just send me a payment and I'll ship one to you. These ones will all be signed. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's quite simple other than just uh, sending me a message. But uh, so if there's anything else, Amandeep, that you wanted to... Yeah, so, uh, so thanks very much, everybody. I'm so write to Javale if you if you would like a book and you're outside of Canada. Um, there'll be an email coming out at the end of this, which will have his email address and other contact yeah. there. If you asked a question, but and breathe, Pam, Indy, Jasper, Pritpal, Avi, Aisha, Naresh, and you don't have his book and you would like one, write to me, message me after this, and uh, we'll get a sign out, out for you because I appreciate that you. Uh, uh, Appreciate you contributing today. Look, everyone, there's been hundreds of people online, which I'm really pleased that there's more questions than we could even get close to answering. Javala, if you pick those up and have a shot at some of them on social media, it just keeps the conversation going. Absolutely. Uh, big, thank you, big thank you to you, uh, not just for today, but also for stepping in because this wasn't billed as your slot. Um, and you stepped in when our other speaker dropped out at the last minute. So I'm just hugely grateful to you for doing that. And thank you very much to the hundreds of people that are on line right now. Next week, George Morton Jack, jump onto our website, register for that right now. Thank you, everyone.